Went out and, uh, man, what glorious weather, right? Y'all with me? All right, come on. Thanks for coming out tonight. I want to welcome you. You don't have to be all jacked up and pepped up or whatever, but just at least alive. You know, I don't ask for anything more than that. Just be a live crowd. Now, you might be over it by the time I get done, but I understand that. But at the beginning, you got to be going or, or we got problems all the way around. I uh, want to thank you for coming tonight and uh, welcome you and thank God for glorious days like what we've had. I feel like the people online always want to know what's happening with the weather, so we tell them, you know. And uh, tonight, if you're here, you're going to get to go on back into Revelation, the book of Revelation. We've been trying to make our way through it, not just reading it and not just uh, going ahead and trying to look at it from all the ways that great scholars do, but rather instead trying to look at it the way that I feel like Jesus did with his teaching, and that's simply simply looking at it, that he's got a purpose behind everything that he says. He didn't uh, turn around and after he died on the cross and rose from the dead, suddenly get complicated. In fact, one of the things that his disciples loved about him was the way that he taught and that uh, he didn't teach like the great teachers of the law, but he taught in parables and he taught simply and he tried to go ahead and explain things, that there are applications of heavenly things here on this earth, like families. Families are a picture of the family in heaven, like our fathers, and that's why he could, through him, we can now call the Almighty God our Father that's in heaven. And he used things in relationships to try to teach us how he wants a relationship with us, as I talked about on Sunday. But in doing this, he continually was talking about the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. And one of the greatest studies you can ever do is just take your concordance out and look up that kingdom of God and see how many ways that he tried to describe it through these simple earthly type things. I share that as a reminder because so often when we approach Revelation, we suddenly begin to go, oh man, this thing is so scary or this thing is so hard or so this or so that. And I don't want to for one minute begin to proclaim or portray to you that, man, I've just got this thing all wrapped up. I just want to say, I've just felt from God and his spirit that, man, just relax a little bit and look at the big pictures here. And the biggest picture of all is, I've shared with many of you, but is, is the two extremes one is, is that what it book points out to us is that we've gotten way too entirely comfortable with the devil. And that the devil, if you take and you break his name down after you remove the D, what's left? Evil. And that he is far more evil than we ever think, ever imagined. Far more evil than we sometimes approach because we can get comfortable with not only him but with sin. And we begin to almost look and like some of our friends, you know, that, oh, well, you know, I'd rather party with the devil than I would go ahead and be bored in heaven strumming a harp sitting on a cloud. And what they fail to realize is, no, there is nothing comfortable about the devil. There's nothing good about the devil. There's nothing fun about the devil. Because as this book, as we've looked at over the past several months, one of the things that it portrays is, is that, no, he uses you. He entices us and brings us into things that do feel good for a moment, but it's short-lived. And afterwards, the regret sometimes is terrible, but not only the regret, the shame if we get caught, and not only that, but sometimes the addictions that can begin to take place, and not just the ones that people always are so quick to point at, but addiction of any kind is sinful, right? And when it's that it becomes our master, and that's what he's out to do. He also is the master at being able to, like he tried to do with Job, that when tough times hit us, he makes us believe that somehow or another God's let us down. That God's mistreating us. And that could be the farthest thing from the truth. But that's what he does because he's a deceiver. And that's what this book points out is, is that he is evil and all those with him are evil. And the principalities and the different ones and the beast and the false prophet, all are of him. And they all talk a good game, but man, they don't deliver. He is a God that's not worth bowing down to because he always expects more for you than you thought you were, you were going to have to give. He wants you to pay more than what you want to pay. And it's going to take you farther than you ever dreamed you'd go. So he is very evil. And the book of Revelation sets that up because the church already in less than 100 years, had begun to get comfortable again with the world. And I don't mean to say that, that we're supposed to be hoity-toity or nose up in the air. I don't mean we're to be self-righteous in the least bit or whatever, but we've got to make a delineation between what part of the world gets into us and when are we in the world. And the ship is fine in the water, but it's wrong when the water gets in the ship. And so this book tries to do that. On the other extreme, then, it tries to make God, or it doesn't try, but it presents God as more holy than we sometimes think that he is. Because one of the things that when we get comfortable with sin, we also try to do is get comfortable with God. We make him a buddy. We make him a friend. And don't get me wrong, God wants to be your buddy and your friend. But man, I really do believe that he gave me the dad he gave me because my dad taught me that when I take 
his fatherhood for granted, I'm suddenly not his friend, you know? He doesn't want to be my buddy. He is my dad. And when I needed a dad, he was there. But even still to this day, even though I'm 60 years old, my dad is still willing to be my dad and my mom is still willing to be my mom. And I love going to them for their wisdom and for their insight, for their protection, for their prayers. God wants us to remember that he is the almighty God. Now, we get to be a part of him through Jesus Christ and his blood, through his atonement on the cross, through his resurrection. We're promised also a resurrection. So we get those things. But man, don't take for one minute that God is not holy. That's why it took Jesus everything he gave to make us holy. And now that we've been granted that holiness, he wants us then to grow in that holiness. And the whole role of the Holy Spirit is that through us that we're sanctified now, we become more and more pure. But you see, when we don't take the devil as evil, but rather instead comfortable, and when we don't take God as awesome and almighty, but rather instead as just kind of a buddy and a friend, we suddenly kind of neutralize this whole valley and we begin to then deceive ourselves and our relationship doesn't really grow and our appreciation and admiration for God dissipates because we're just about feeling good. And so this book was written because the church was starting to feel good about being in the world. And he said, no, man, and like we looked last week, come out from them. You know, be separate. And again, it doesn't mean that we suddenly have to dress altogether differently. We have to act like egotistical people or holier than thou. No, 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 no. It just means that at the same time, We understand and we have our sensories up because the Holy Spirit alerts us and we recognize when we're starting to get too close to this line of comfort with sin instead of going ahead and being way over the line over here with holiness. And you better believe for, I mean, at least for me and my experiences, it's difficult to be around sin and to remain holy. It's easy to begin to compromise. And so that's the theory behind this book, in my opinion. And so it's not about date setting and it's not about trying to guess which one's the beast. It's about going ahead and recognizing, man, that I could be in any one of these situations. What's my choice? Tonight, the one, as we go back to chapter 18, then is about this city of Babylon. And in this city, as I said last week, I think it could be America. I could think it could be any one of the big cities in America. It could be Atlanta. But, man, the truth is it could be me. Because in many regards, you know, if this is the temple of God, But if I'm mistreating it, then I become like Babylon was and I begin to think I've accomplished all these things and suddenly then the truth and the reality is going to hit and God's going to make it clear someday. But we know from Paul writing in Romans that he said, God, it's your kindness that leads us to what? Repentance. And if we're not willing to receive his kindness that would lead us to repentance, he'll remove some of that kindness and allow us to find out what life's like on our own. And so sometimes through hardship or tragedy or whatever, and I'm not saying that all hardship and all tragedy is that way. I'm not saying it's all from God. I'm just saying that there are things that God will do to get our attention because he loves us. There's other times that he uses our hardship and our situations to go ahead and appeal to the world to show that we still, like Job, we say, man, God gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord because the world's not used to seeing that. But God wants us to repent, and he wants us to turn, and he wants to pull the world into that. And I think that what Babylon reflects here, that although a city and although presented much like a woman, and nothing against the ladies in here, that what it reflects is somebody that continued to do things their way. The old Frank Sinatra, I want to do it my way. And that after a while, he said, okay, my grace is extended as far as it will go when you keep refusing it. And as a result of that, I'm going to let you experience life without grace. And when we're not protected by God's grace, and I'm not talking about that you have to become a Christian. I think God's grace begins way before we ever turn to the Lord. As I said with the guys group Monday night, I believe that if we didn't have the grace of God around us and protecting our hearts, I think the moment we entered life into this world that the devil would capture that and jump inside of our souls and we'd all be possessed. But because of God's grace, he holds that and he allows us to experience innocence until the world or the people of the world start robbing it from us. Sometimes, though, we begin robbing ourselves from that grace because we start thinking we can handle this and do that, and God doesn't know what he's talking about. That's the Old Testament. That's old God. That's even the New Testament is old now. And what's God know about life today? He knows a lot about life, and he knows what kind of life really is soul-satisfying, let alone eternal, versus that that's just super or that is just temporary and that in some regards is, is only temporary even in the joy that it would bring. So I use that as an introduction as tonight we jump on into 18 and get through it if we, if we can, if I'll let him. So let's pray.
Father and God, tonight, I don't want it to be my word, but yours. Not only the word that we can read and see, but I thank you for it. I thank you that it is a seed in our heart, a seed that leads to not only salvation, but enhances the salvation we already have. I thank you, God, that it is a seed that continues to grow and that what it grows is faith, faith that is as small as a mustard seed that isn't designed to stay a seed but goes ahead and plants, dies, grows. And God, that that's what you want it to do with us. I'm thankful that, Lord, you tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing not just anything and everything, but the eternal faith comes from your eternal word. And that it is, Lord, both milk and meat. And tonight, Lord, wherever we each are, I just pray that we would have a satisfying meal from you. As we look to your word, that we would understand with our mind. Or, Lord, that it would at least begin that thought process. I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that they don't take what I say. But, God, look at what you've said. Pray that they compare it to what else you say in the scriptures, Lord. That that it would be your truth and not mine. That it would be your voice, Lord. And it's your desire, God, to speak through even me, not because of how great I am, because of your greatness in spite of my lack, to show, God, your grace and how far you'll go, that each person that's here tonight, Lord, if they want, and they're praying right now to hear from you, that they'd hear something that there's no way Steve would know, but you do. And so, God, that's my prayer. Let my words fall to the floor. Let yours be heard. And let us explore, Lord, just with our minds, God, with with sense, with, with that spirit that you have given us, along with our spirit joined with your Holy Spirit, God, that we would want to seek both the truth, but also, Lord, understanding. And so grant that tonight, I pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And so in chapter 18, we read, After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So in other words, it's fallen, you know? I think of that uh, thing as a kid growing up, again, one of those violent cartoon type things, but fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. I have no idea if that's politically correct or anything. That's just the way the story goes. But it was about Jack and what? The beanstalk. And then he climbed this beanstalk. His mom thought he was crazy, and he climbed this magical bean that he threw in the ground, and they made this great big stalk, and he climbed up the stalk, and he got up there, not to heaven, but rather instead, he found things that were unbelievable. He found that golden goose that laid the golden eggs and then all of a sudden he found that oh my this fee fi fo fum this giant of a thing that was horrendous came after him and back and forth the story goes or the cartoon if you watched it but the story in the book goes until finally jack's about to be caught and he goes skinny and down that beanstalk and he actually beats the giant down to the bottom while the giant's climbing down the stalk what does jack do chops it down he chops it down and whoa you know boom the earth collapses around him and way Jack wins and the, the, whatever the ogre is gone, you know. So that's the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. I don't think it has anything to do with this. But when he fell, he was done. He was done. And in the same way, when there are things that God says it's over, guess what, folks? It's over. When he said it's done, it's done. It's not medium rare. It's not medium well. It's well done. And it's over. And we've got this time that we don't know, but we've got time that we have to seek him and to give our life to him. And there's going to come an end to time as we know it. And if it doesn't come in for my time and dying, there will come a time for all of us then when he said it's the last day. And the last day means there will be no more sun, moon, and stars because that's how we know it's day and night, right? There'll be no more because he's going to say it's an end to it. They will leave. The earth will be destroyed. But God's word will remain forever. And so what we see here in this then is this declaration fallen as Babylon the Great. The angel is only speaking for God. He's not speaking of himself. In fact, anybody that speaks for God is technically an angel in that regard. But this is an angel that is clear. John sees and understands. He's mesmerized almost by it as these visions continually go on. It says, she has become a home for demons, a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. How do you become that? By being empty, not filled with God, but empty. And so the spirits, the evil spirits, are willing to jump in. Jesus even told the story, if you're cleaned out and you're not filled up, what happens? That spirit leaves and goes through other regions and brings back, so you become seven times worse than you were before, brings back others with it. And that's somewhat this picture here, that it's gone and now the demons are able to just live and dwell in this nothingness, in this, um, and there have been many movies, you know, I think of that kind of portray this and whether you want to believe in The Walking Dead or you want to believe in some of these like the Mad Max type stuff or whatever like that, but all kind of stories. And, and it's odd to me that people of the world are doing these movies about the end times and when, when things really are desolate 
And I mean, it's just kind of creepy, in fact, if you watch any of it or whatever. But it's part of what this says is going to happen. And this is a city that was splendorous, that was uh, unbelievable, that glistened in the sun, everything about it. I mean, it was just tremendous. And the people that went there had fun, and they made a lot of money with the stuff they got, and they traded. Back and forth they went. And that's what we read then. So it says, verse 3, that it becomes this haunt, but all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. And we've covered this, and even to this next big part here that I'm about to read, we've already covered that in the previous weeks. But I just want to remind you, I mean, he sets this thing up, and it talks about then how great, but also how, you know, the great will fall even greater, much like the giant and jack and the beanstalk. I heard another voice from heaven say, so here's one angel, here comes another. Another voice that says, come out of her, my people, so that you'll not share in her sins. Shall you not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to the heavens. And that's what we looked at last week. And that's God compelling us, Jesus Christ's voice compelling us. Come on, you're my bride. Don't go messing around with that because it's not going to do you any good. So come out of her. And it's about this holiness thing. For her sins are piled up to the heaven. God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as, she's given, as she has given. Pay her back double for what she's done. Mix her, in fact, a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and the luxury that she gave herself. This is where we went back and looked at the rich man and Lazarus last week when we saw that, man, he had it great. That's what Abraham's call is. He said, man, he said, when you're in that other life, you had it great. He had it bad. Now it's reversed. And I mean, I think that's what's important that we live now and not expecting to be like the world, but that we begin to have this heavenly mindset that we begin to see the blessings that aren't necessarily what even some Christians would call prosperity. That it's not about the stuff and the dollars. And don't get me wrong, it's not that I have vowed some kind of vow of poverty, but man, I mean, the older I get, the more I'm looking at and saying, wow, God, I used to be just content with the tithe, and have I lived in luxury to the point that I've believed that I've accomplished and not you or just because I want to blame it on you and say, well, God's blessed me just so much. I think it's vital that we keep this balance and understand he is our provider and he loves to give. But let's make sure that we don't begin to either believe we did it on our own or that without it, we're nothing. Because the whole thing is, is man, I mean, if it comes right down to it, what's the one thing we don't want to let go of? Jesus, right? Jesus. If we've got him, we've got richness. Paul even talks in the book of Corinthians, he said about Jesus, when he's talking about him, he said that he became, although he was extremely rich, he became very poor and impoverished for us that we might become rich. And the richness that he's talking about there isn't dollars and cents according to the world's standards. It's about spirit. It's about life, that we would become eternal life people and not just worldly life people. And so that's the picture here. But he's saying, come out, come out, come out. Not from wherever you are, but come out from this that isn't of me. Come out from this. And what oftentimes is the world sucks the people in from the church and they don't want to belong to the church. They'd rather belong to the world. And we don't understand what God's design of the church was. And we begin to then say, but these people over here treat me so much better. They accept me just the way I am. And it's not that the church shouldn't, but it's not all that the church is supposed to do, is it? We're to be involved in restoration. We're to be involved in encouragement. We're to be involved in love. And it's the way that it goes. We're to be in law and involved in giving the benefit of the doubt and knowing heart and everything in that regard. But man, if you're part of the world and the world's saying, oh, you're great, you're great, and you don't feel like people at church say how great you are, then you begin to say, I'd rather go where people think I'm great. But there's a cost to that greatness sometime, and, the, and this Babylon is about to receive it, it says, or has anyway. Therefore, verse 8 says, in one day... In one day, plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. I didn't give this to Rosa, so excuse me, Rosa, but if you've got your Bible and you want to go back, let's read this last church in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18, the church at Thyatira, because here it talks about this female, and again, ladies, it's not against you, but use a female presence to get across a picture. As he writes to the church at Thyatira, he said in verse 19, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. And I love this part. He says, and you're now doing more than you did at first. Isn't that great? Don't you hope God sees that in you? Jesus sees that in you or sees that in us as a church. We're doing more than we did at first. 
We're growing in him, right? Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads uh, my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. Now, time, what does that mean? I think it implies a set time, a fair amount of time coming from God, time to repent. But you see, we don't have a clock in front of us saying, okay, you've only got this many minutes left. And so we tend to think what? I've got time. But we don't know how long we'll live, number one. And number two, we don't know how long until, whoops, that was too far. He said, I've given her time to repent, but she's unwilling. And man, I hope that we aren't of that kind of heart. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. and I'll make those that commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless, what? Unless they repent of their ways. You see that, that, that beckoning of God, man, but, but you can repent. And that's what he told, I think, five out of the seven churches here in the book of Revelation is that we need to repent. And I don't think it's just those churches. I think it's us today that are part of the church, that he, he loves repentance when it's sincere. So anyway, he said, I'll cast her on a bed of suffering. I'll make those that commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways, and I'll strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and get this, I will repay each of you according to your deeds. That's his word, not mine. That's still read, read in the red letter editions. I'll repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira that don't hold to her teaching. You've not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. You haven't had to go ahead and try it to see if you liked it, Mikey. I will not impose any other burden on you. Sorry, Mike and Mike. But uh, uh, only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I'll give authority over the nations. He'll rule them with an iron scepter and dash them to pieces, dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I received authority from my father, I'll give him the morning star. If you got an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I look back here at Jezebel. or That was Jezebel. This is Babylon. And I look back here and I see that he's given her time, but she's unwilling and so now the time is up. So when one day plagues will overtake her. So I'm back to 18, uh, verse 8. Death, mourning, and famine shall be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord their God who judges. Now, again, this, these are pictures, big pictures. It's like cartoons, exaggerated uh, caricatures, so to speak. Not exaggerated in the sense that there's no truth to it, but he's just trying to get us to get the big picture with this. And the big picture isn't pointing at everybody else saying, oh, that must be her, that must be him, that must be them. The big picture is, first of all, God, is it me? One of the, my favorite parts, and it sounds like in a lot of ways, I think for a lot of people, one of the favorite parts of Risen as they went through the kind of the uh, play, this experience play that they went through was the guys around the, the Lord's Supper. And our guys jumped on their characters and began to really plead, Lord, Lord, it can't be me because, Lord, surely it's not me. I hope not because... And, and that's what this is. It's, it's that picture. And that's to me is what was healthy is each one of them didn't automatically. There's no way it's me. It wasn't that. It was, Lord, is it I? Is there any way I could betray you? And that's the same way here. We ought to be looking at this and going, God, is that me? Are you warning me, Lord? Are you about ready to let my life and my, my, all that I have collapse around me? Because you see, if we're walking with him, even if it does collapse, we know it's not his judgment. That's the coolest thing. If we're walking with him, we have his peace and his security and his promises. We can look and go, God, is there anything I've done that's caused this? But we don't have to automatically feel guilty about it. But at the same time, if we've lost track of what holiness is and we're becoming unholy, we're playing more at the world than we're, and we're only playing church, then he might want to get our attention. Why? Because he hates us? No, because he loves us enough that he wants, to be, wants us to be restored with him. That's his design, is he wants us to be restored with him. He wants us to have this relationship with him that isn't afraid. And again, go back and just look up in a concordance. Don't be afraid or uh, use the word afraid and don't or whatever. But man, Jesus said it over and over again. And so this book isn't written to cause us to be afraid. The fear we're to have out of this is that holy fear and that respect, that awe of God. And going, man... If you say that this is best for me and that's not good for me, God, I want your best, not what I might think looks really good right now. Isn't that the way it works? And isn't that what every parent tries to do with their kids? Am I right? You try to teach them that, man, 
this might look really good right now. It's not good. That might, there might be somebody that's going to ask you to do this, and you're going to say, oh, I feel like I need to do it because it just seems over. It's not good. But how come we can do that as parents, but we can't do that or receive it from our parent in heaven, our father that's in heaven? And so this is the picture that he's giving of someone. In this case, he's representing it by a city. Um, and earlier in 17, it was like the woman had seemed to be combined here together. Uh, but nonetheless, anyway, now it's being pictured. And he said, she will be consumed by fire for mighty is the Lord our God who judges her. Then we read on. Because I think that what happens here is grace is removed. And, and what God's about to do, he said, consumed by fire for mighty is the Lord the God who judges her. Did he not promise us that he owned something or had possession of something that we don't need to do it ourselves? It begins with a B, and it's called what? Vengeance. He said it very clearly, just like he said about the tithe, it's mine. He's saying, relax, I've got this. You don't have to worry about getting even with people. I've got it. You worry about loving people. I've got the vengeance thing. And the sad part is, is when he takes over, man, it's swift, and it's complete, and it's fair. But he said, she'll be consumed by fire for mighty is the Lord of God who judges her. We forget how mighty he is. And it's not, again, that we're to be scared of him, but we ought to have a holy reverence for him. We ought to look how far he went because he loved us to put his son on the cross and to let him hang there. I, I just cannot imagine whether it's the whipping, the beating, the insults the spitting and then the cross and just mm. but they'd agreed this is the plan before adam and eve were even born verse 9 when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning they'll weep and they'll mourn over her terrified at her torment they'll stand far off and cry whoa whoa oh great city oh babylon the city of power in one hour your doom has come the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys her cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. I mean, and, and to us, even it's amazing how many of those things are still valuable today. But imagine how much more valuable they were back then, you know, and what it took to get those and to mine them and even the lives maybe that costs were given in, in trying to get those out of the mine. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense and myrrh and frankincense. And here we're getting into some of the stuff that Jesus was wrapped up in for his burial. Wine, olive oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages. And then get this one. Did you already read that one? The bodies and souls of men. See, that's what's valuable to God. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because they can't get this stuff anymore. But one of the things that stuff got were the bodies and the souls of men. And whether it happened in the mines as they were trying to mine it, and I'm not throwing judgment on those people, I'm just saying there's a cost in all that stuff, right? I mean, the more precious it is, the harder it is to get. I mean, in the gold rush and cowboy movies and stuff like that were made up of those that were find the gold or find the silver vein in the mine, you know, and somebody would let them get it out and then they'd kill them to get them for themselves. The bodies and the souls of men. You see, I think it's vital that we remember that this costs something. But there are a lot of people, they can take a life and never bat an eye, never think a thing about it. You know, I mean, we hear story after story, and it's one thing, two people in a defensive situation shooting it out. It's another thing. Man, but these kids, or that child that was thrown off the third floor of that mall and dropped, or the parents that will kill their kids. I mean, how does that happen? And it happens because we lose the grace of God, and we begin to just suddenly values change. And what's valuable to God isn't valuable to us. What's valuable to us is whatever we feel at the moment. And you ask, why did you? I don't know. And they don't, but it's like they're possessed. Is it possible today? I think so. I think there's a lot of possession that goes on. And, 
man, it's, it's one of my biggest questions to God is, how did you know all the time? And when is it mental illness and when is it possession? You know, but the souls of men, maybe stick something there and go back with me to the other end of the Bible. That would be Genesis chapter 4. In this story in chapter 4, this is where after Adam and Eve, after they got married, so to speak, they were brought together by God and how great it was and they loved each other and God would be with them and everything like that. The two will become one and then suddenly they're together and even then they're not able to help each other stay away from the tree, but rather instead they help each other to the tree. And then after that, we go into chapter 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord... I brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. So motherhood happened. Babies are born. Wow, they're like amazed. I think it would be. Can you imagine that? I mean, you got to remember these two people didn't have a belly button, you know? Uh, They just were made by God. But now everything else since has had a belly button. Some are cute, some are not. Innies, outies, you know, depending on how you look at it, I guess. But but uh, some are filled with lint. If you've got a real good any, you know. But nonetheless, so here these two boys come, and I just can't imagine what that would be like because I still think birth is miraculous, you know, and I've, I've watched it with animals. I've never watched it with humans yet. But, but, man, just to see that baby fresh and everything that way, it's just like, wow, 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 wow. I can't imagine Adam and Eve and, and how God must have had to have helped them to deliver this baby or whatever, these babies, you know, and, and it's like, whoa, it's a real human being. I just thought it was something I ate, you know, but it's not. And it's a human being. And she quickly forgets the pain of childbirth, just like he says, right? Now, Abel kept the flocks, means that he was a shepherd, and Cain worked the soil, means he was a farmer in the course of time. And that worked out together because, you know, the farmer or the guy raising the sheep needed the farmer, and the farmer needed the sheep. So they would work things out, you would think. This would be great, two brothers working together. But in time... Cain brought, or in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soils and offering to the Lord. But Abel brought the fat portions and some of the firstborn of his flock. What's the difference? Well, some people say one's a blood sacrifice. They hadn't, they hadn't been told about blood sacrifices. I think there's two things that go on with a gift that's pleasing to God. We can see it with the woman that gave her two mites. One is she didn't do it because anybody made her. She certainly didn't do it to impress anybody. But she gave all that she had, even out of her poverty she gave, and she impressed Jesus with it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What Abel did was pleasing to God. So I'm presuming that this was out of faith, that he said, man, in the same way that we were born to our mother, you've now born or given us birth from our livestock. God, I want to give you the very first one from this sheep. Here, it's yours. And that's what he gave. It was just out of his heart, maybe out of his walk. I don't know how God spoke, whether it's the same as he does today through spirit or what, you know, but he brought it to God. Cain went ahead and he decided to give him some of the fruit, but, but did he do it because, well, God liked that, so okay, I'll give something to, or was it begrudgingly, or was it without faith? I would say at least it was without faith. Anyway, nonetheless, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, makes it pretty clear, he didn't look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And what happens when we get angry and we get downcast? We've got to blame somebody. When he didn't take it up with God, he started looking at his brother. That's what we do. We get mad at somebody because we've got to blame somebody. And sometimes the person that did it's not the one. So we pick somebody else out that we're going to go ahead and let them know. The Lord even spoke to Cain. That's why I'm saying I think he may have spoke to Abel and spoke to both of them about, hey, why don't you consider how I've blessed you? Why don't you bless back? And it's not that God wanted any fat portions or, or that he wanted any corn, you know? It was just that that fat smells good when it's burning even to God, I think. You know, it's just like, man, can somebody be grilling in the neighborhood? And you go, man, that sounds good. It smells good. Um, but but God, so God speaks to Cain and he's saying, whoa, 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 I see where this is going. He said, why are you angry? Good question. For us to hear God asking us. What makes you mad? Well, they really made me mad when they said, no. Nah. He said, what? They said something that made you mad? He said, what makes you mad? Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? 
You ever look in the mirror? I know today it's cool to have the pouty lip, but, you know. <laughs> Dad, you say, if you don't pull that lip back up into your face, he said, I'm going to go ahead and step on it, you know, because he didn't like that lip hanging out, man. He said, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? In other words, don't blame somebody else, dude. It's you. I'm willing to receive from you. Why don't you say, God, what would it take? What, you, okay, this wasn't good, but what would make it great? Instead, he wants to eliminate the competition. Same story. Another verse. 2,000 years since Jesus was here. Possibly 4,000 years prior to that. Cain's mad at somebody, and we still get mad today. If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, notice... Sin is crouching at your door. That's that little thing inside of there that goes, well, I ought to just, you know, man, if I could, you know, I would, you know. And then you go from thinking about it to where you start plotting it, and you go from plotting it to where you do it. Sin is crouching at your door. Picture of a tiger getting ready to pounce. You ever feel that? Man, that's the, that's the most important thing that we can ever pray to God is, God, when that's happening, let me see it. Let me feel it. Let me not be deceived. If sin is crouching at my door, the last thing I want to do is step through that door. Right? Every time you do, do you lose or do you win? You lose. Go out another door. Change your mind. That's what repentance is. Sin is crouching at your door. Then what's he say? It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now, man, this is clear back, like I said, at least 6,000 years ago, but here... 2,000 years ago, roughly, or 1,500 to 2,000, 1,600 to 2,000, 1,800 to 2,000, whatever it is, since Jesus was gone, he's writing to his church, and he's telling this story about this Babylon, and he's saying, man, I gave her time to repent. She's unwilling. She's been crouching at her door. She'd keep giving in. I said, no, you know that's not right. You took the blood of my saints. That's what we're about to see. Now, Cain said to his brother Abel, hey, well, sin is crouching at your door. It desired to have you, but you must what? master it doesn't mean get out the master card it just means you've got to take authority over it by what denying it cain said to his brother abel let's go out to the field in other words he didn't listen to god did he he didn't master it he walked through that door let's go out to the field and while they're in the field he attacked his brother abel and killed him then the lord said to cain where's your brother abel i don't know he said am i my brother's keeper and the lord said what have you done? And now get this part, because I think this is what's forgotten. And this is what I want you to remember as we read Revelation. He said, what have you done? Listen. Can you hear it? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You know, a part of Adam's name was dirt. And yet the dirt spoke. The blood's crying out. Now, if it happened there, what were the shouts around the bottom of that cross like? What was the blood splatter over the paved stones there in the courtyard where Jesus was whipped? What was it like? What was the blood even in the garden as maybe they tightened those chains or those ropes up on Jesus Christ? They took him and they pounded him in the face. Oh, man, I can't imagine how loud it was. No wonder God allowed that darkness to come in just to some other, maybe if possible, to block him from even being able to see it. But the shouts of the blood of Christ coming up to him. Can you hear it? And you see, Jesus is the one that told us. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I'm telling you, no. I'm telling you, don't even be angry. It says don't murder, but don't even be angry. It's the same as murdering. We don't believe it, do we? Because we anger ourselves all the time. And we don't for one moment believe it's crying out to God. He's saying, man, that tongue of yours. He's saying those actions that you want to take, that talking behind their back. He said, man, I'm telling you, it cries out to me. And what I want you to see is, so here's this in the beginning, and here's this at the end. And he's finally saying, I'm telling you, vengeance is mine. I'm going to reclaim that blood. I'm going to hold those people responsible. And they're not going to have a lawyer that's going to get them off. God's got 10 ways to Sunday to be able to go ahead and to bring it about. But man, when he said it's over, it's over. 
And that's what I want us to see here is that the blood of people that shed their blood because of their faith in Christ still cries out to God. And it's not, not that God won't forgive, but God can't forgive the stubborn heart that won't even ask for it. God loves repentance. And I think we have to be real careful that we don't presume, well, I repented back then or I repented... Man, the only time that sometimes we repent is when somebody's done something to us. We come to God and go, oh, Lord, won't you help me here? And he said, I, I let it happen so you can understand that's what you've done here, here, and here. God's always working. It's out of his love because he wants us to see with our eyes and to see with our heart what he sees. He wants us to understand. And instead of it being about us, it ought to be about others. But yet what's about us is this. Am I babbling? Lord, is it I? Man, he said their blood back over here, the bodies and souls of men, the blood cries out to me from the ground. Can't you hear it? Verse 14, they will say, the fruit you long for is gone. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants that sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off. Terrified at the torment, they'll weep and they'll mourn. Oh, man, didn't we love it when that happened? Cry out, whoa, whoa, oh, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. That's the second time it says that. The first time was up there in verse 10. In one hour, your doom has come. This one says in verse 17, in one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Down in verse uh, 19, it says in one hour, she's been brought to ruin. I was intrigued with that, and I looked up. In Matthew chapter 6, that famous passage that most of us know because it's real to me. It's how I had to use and still have to use to keep myself from worrying. It said, by worrying, can you add a single hour to your life? And the obvious answer is what? Nope. So why do you do it? Doctors will tell you that worry will take hours off your life, if not days. Jesus said, can you, by worrying, add a single hour? If you can't do that, why would you do it? And then in last week's story with Matthew 26 and in the garden, when he asked Peter and James and John, the three that had been with him on several different things, above and beyond what the other disciples were, he brought them over and said, man, he said, I want you to pray with me. Pray with me, if you will. And he went on over to pray. Told him to pray not that they would not enter into temptation. He already told Peter, he said, man, Satan's asked to sift you like wheat. I prayed for you. And now Jesus said, won't you pray for me? And he came back. What were they doing? Sleeping. Remember what he asked him? Couldn't you pray with me for just one hour? In one hour, your doom has come. In one hour, you've come to ruin. Man, I mean, that's the way it, easy come, easy goes, what I used to hear growing up. And it can be easier than what we even dream. We think we've invested correctly. We know what's going to happen. There's no way, man. This country of ours and its financial structure in the world, it's as shaky as shaky can be. It's what it is right now. It's kind of like the test with the doctors at Mayo. Well, what'd it show? Well, they used to say, it's your normal. So, okay, that's good. That's good for today because that's about as long as that test is really good for. It just shows you what it is right now. But we have these things that we begin to believe or somehow or another eternal or that we got, you know. And it's a house of cards, folks. That's why it says don't build your life on anything else except what? The rock. Because the storms will come. They wash away stuff. But as long as you're on the foundation and it's on me, he said, you've got it. Every sea captain, all who travel by ship, the sailors and all that earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they'll exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? I think it'd be just like if, if Vegas, you know, suddenly just got swallowed up in the earth and everybody, oh, man, I'd hope to go there. Oh, we went once. We had the time of our life. I don't remember what we did, but I know it was fun. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that we associate with. I remember uh, some of the friends I went to high school with, that the palace. Now, you got to remember when I was in high school, back in the 70s, and disco fever and this and that, disco this way and disco that, and 
you know, different things. And there was this place called the palace. I even had an ID so I could get in. Didn't drink, but I just wanted to get in because I didn't want to miss out on whatever was going on. And they tore the palace down there a couple years ago. I mean, I didn't cry, but some people did. Oh, man, wasn't that the greatest time of life? I don't know, puking your guts out. Was that a blast or what, you know? <laughs> but it's funny how we do that and we look. And, and instead of going, oh, my gosh, it's not just gone, but I'm going to be gone someday. Will I die in, in ruins or will I die healthy, right with God? Anyway, they just, they begin to mourn and they're, oh, 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 it's never going to be the same. And there are things that seem, that are life changing. I mean, if our power grid goes out, life will never be the same for us again. Everything we've got is not only dependent on electricity, but today it's on computers, isn't it? I mean, people say if the power goes, well, I'll get, you know, in my truck and I'm going to drive out and, you know, get, with what kind of gas? You can't get gas out of the, you know, pump without any electricity, let alone with a computer to turn it on. All those things where the pipelines come through, I mean, they're all run off of what? Electricity and computers. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm just saying, folks, we li live in a fictitious world. I mean, it's cartoon stuff. It's here right now, but there's no guarantees. It's not everlasting. And that's what the Lord tries to get across. Anyway, to finish up here we got i don't have much time to finish up rejoice over her O heaven verse 20 i'm sorry rejoice saints and apostles and prophets god's judge for the way she treated you this is one difficult passage for me i trust that he's not blowing smoke he's saying there's going to come a day when you see how evil evil is and how gracious god was and how holy god is and you'll rejoice that you're counted as a part of it. Because I've often wondered, how can heaven be without tears? If you can know as what Abraham could see, that Lazarus was over there in torment. And the only thing I can say is, is I trust that it's because when you see all that Jesus Christ did, how could anybody refuse him? But we do. Sin's crouching at our door. You must master it. Is Jesus Lord of our life or just the Lord? So I don't have time to finish it up like I'd planned on. Uh, but uh, we've got time to just let soak in a little bit. As a church, we offer communion each week, and not only Sundays, but on Wednesdays. Why? As often as you meet together, do this in remembrance of me. Don't force it on anybody. Don't prevent anybody. It's for believers. If you want it, it's your call between you and Jesus. But tonight as we take it, let's be, uh, you know, just aware. And uh, aware that, man, look at this grace of God. If his blood cries out, man, may it be in us and not on the ground, right? May we not trample it under our feet, but might we take full advantage of it. And I mean by that, not... Not the wrong, not the evil side of advantage, but rather instead the grace side of advantage. Take full advantage of the grace of God that his blood would purify us. Don't just let it walk into the, or flow or, or drip into the ground. Ask for the Lord to just let his blood be inside of you and his forgiveness and all that it brings about the change so that we don't have to be deceived by the world, but rather instead we can be just warmed with God and know that even if everything we've got disappears, blessed be the name of the Lord. Father and God, tonight as we share communion together, uh, Lord, it is, first of all, personal. Each one of us face-to-face -face with you. And as we mentioned about Judas and, and, Lord, the guys at 12 and praying for an hour and that night, Lord, just right after that, when they were sleeping, they were awakened then and Judas came over to you and betrayed you with a kiss. Lord, tonight as we bring the cup to our lips, may it be a kiss, but may it not be a betrayal, but rather instead of need, of appreciation, of adoration and admiration, 
and a desire for holiness. So God, that we would allow you and your Holy Spirit to help us to be aware. And what of the world is just flat out worldliness and what, Lord, of it is, is ours to love, but not the stuff, but rather instead the people. And not seeing them in luxury, but seeing them destitute. God, that if we don't tell our friends and our neighbors, and, and, and not in a judgment way, not in a condemning way, not expecting somebody that doesn't believe to live up to our standards, but if we don't tell them what you've done for us, how will they know? And so, God, we pray that we would allow your blood to not only bring us forgiveness, but if it's in us, that we would speak forgiveness and your grace and your mercy to others. We would want to tell them about the Lord that saved us over and over again. Even though it was with one act on the cross, Lord, and even though we accepted you, it is still renewed every time that we recommit to you. God, we don't want to go, out, go through the door where sin is crouching. We want to go through the door and you said, the one that you stand at and you knock. May we open it and come in to you and do as you said, eat with us. May we eat with you. And so tonight, Lord, it's not much of a nourishing meal, but man, spiritually, it's a feast. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.